Okay, uh, welcome everyone and welcome all the students who are joining us online and all those who are here, present here. Let's pray and we get started. Father, we thank you for this uh, opportunity, God, just to get together and study and learn and uh, grow in your truth, grow in your word, grow in your ways. Uh, and Father, even as we journey through this course, pray for each of us present here in the class, online, in the e-learning, uh, that we will be enriched, that our hearts and minds will be enriched to God, and that we will be equipped to better communicate uh, the truth that we believe and to explain it and to or to respond to questions uh, that people have, that we'll be able to do it accurately. I will be do it, we'll be able to do it with your wisdom. And Lord, that many hearts and lives will be drawn to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So uh, I was just informed that um, the printed notes has not arrived yet. So I think it'll come later today. So for this first lecture, uh, you just have to listen to me. Uh, a little bit, uh, and then uh, they said by afternoon they'll get the note. So you will have it uh, today and for tomorrow's, uh, sorry, tomorrow's holiday. So next week, <laughs> next week's class. Uh, for those of you online, the PDF uh, with this content is uh, in the classroom. So you can download the PDF. Uh, you can follow with me on that, and uh, uh, we'll be able to journey together. All right, let's just introduce you know, this course, BC 212, called Christian Apologetics. So what we are, are going to learn in this course is uh, how to respond to questions that people have about what we believe. And how do we answer those questions? Right? Of course, there are many, many questions. That people will ask, you know, right from the very beginning. The basic thing is, how do you know God is there? How do you know God exists? Yeah. You know, to uh, how do you know God created everything? You know, what about Darwin's theory? What about Big Bang theory? You know, what is our response to these kind of ideas? How do we respond to it? Um, and then. How do you know the Bible is true? You know, we all read the Bible, and every time we're quoting the Bible, how, how do you know it's correct? Because this book was written, you know, the Old Testament, many, almost 2,000 years, or not, yeah, several thousand years ago, all the way up to the first century AD, 2,000 years ago. Uh, how do we know this is correct? Uh, it is not made up. Somebody just wrote some things, you know? How do we know? Uh, and then, also, why do we say, you know, Jesus Christ is unique? You're being very narrow-minded. Uh, why can't, uh, so many, there are so many religions. Why can't we accept anybody follow any religion? Why are you saying we must follow only Jesus? Well, you know, uh, these are all questions that people will ask, right? And uh, how do we know Jesus Christ rose from the dead? That happened 2,000 years ago. None of us were there. How, how are we saying Jesus rose from the dead? Right? So uh, then how do we, you know, uh, uh, why do we say there's salvation only in Jesus? How do we sh then connect it to that? How do we explain or share our faith with the Hindu, person from a Hindu background, uh, to a Muslim? You know, how do we explain Jesus? Because they have their own way of thinking. So we must be careful, or, or not careful, but we must uh, explain in a way that they will understand. Right? So how do we explain for, to a Hindu, to a Muslim, about uh, Jesus? Uh, there, there are other worldviews. Uh, you know, there could be, example, Jews, Buddhists, Jains, so many, so many other worldviews. So that. Uh, we, we won't be able to cover all of them, but at least we will do Hinduism, uh, Hindus and Muslims in detail, explain that, and maybe we'll touch upon a few other things, or even to a Catholic. 
It's very close. But what's the difference? So explaining, you know, we'll talk about some of that. And then uh, some social challenges that we face. Or what do you say about some social topics like uh, uh, divorce, same-sex marriage, abortion, uh, and a few other things? You know, where they want they ask questions. How should we respond correctly, biblically? Right. So we'll touch upon these things. Right. And um, what is that? Some truck, okay. Um, and uh, biblical understanding of suffering. Why is there suffering? If God is a good God, why is He allowing innocent people to suffer? Okay, bad people suffer, good. <laughs> but children, they haven't done anything wrong. Children haven't done anything. Why are innocent people? Babies, you know, suffering. So uh, these kind of questions, you know, people ask. So our goal is to try to understand and how to respond to these, to these questions. Right? Um, we want to be accurate. We want to be biblical, and also we want to be clear uh, in what how we respond to these questions. Uh, and then we will also look at some other common questions, meaning uh, things about in the Bible. Uh, when when people ask, uh, we will try to touch upon. So so now the the fact is there are many questions. We're not going to be able to cover everything, but we're going to cover some of the main things, right? And give you uh, 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 enough understanding to deal with some of the main things. And uh, yeah, so once you get your notes, we will go through. Uh, you'll be able to follow with me uh, on these notes together. Right? So today. We just want to introduce introduce uh, apologetics, and let, let me just uh, sorry, let me just go back and say this: that uh, in the church, in the Christian church, this whole uh, study of, of apologetics, uh, there are different ways. There are different ways that people approach it. Um, there is uh, one is there is the philosophical way. That means. It's more a way of looking at uh, thinking through things, you know, a, 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 a philosophical view of things. So there are uh, certain Christian ministers, preachers, who you know, they call themselves apologists, and their primary way is a philosophical approach. It's more of you know, this is life and. Uh, this is how you look at things, and it's uh, like you look. You're you're reading more about literature, what other worldviews uh, people have thought about things, and then you're responding to it in a very philosophical way. There's another group of Christian apologists who are scientific. That means there are some. So that's the second way, scientific. There are uh, uh, a lot of uh, many Christians. Who are also scientists, right? So they will be experts in certain areas, maybe like mathematics or physics or astronomy or different different streams, and they take a scientific approach to defend the faith. So they will, from a scientific perspective, they will give her answers. So there are Christian apologists who are from that stream. Uh, then there are there is a third one which is purely theological. That means I will tell you this is chapter, this is verse. That is why I'm saying theological. That is also fine, but they're not they're not so much philosophical or scientific, but they're coming from chapter and verse theological. This is why we believe. This is why we say certain things. And then the fourth group would be what we would just say they are they are the supernatural spiritual. They say, look, there are miracles happening, Sign, you know, signs and wonders approach. And uh, that's why we believe there is a God. Miracles are happening. People are being healed. Demons are being cast out. Spiritual. What we want to do is we want to blend all of these. Right? 
um, that means uh, where we can use philosophy, we will use it. Where we can use some scientific reasoning, we will use it. Where we will quote chapter and verse, where we need to quote chapter and verse, we will use it. And where we need to point people to spiritual experiences, supernatural experiences, we will use it. So we will blend in our approach here in this course, we will blend all of them. So we are not going to follow just strictly a philosophical or a scientific. We will, bring, we will cover all, we will blend it. And I feel that that is a good way to do it because different people will respond to different things. So not everybody wants a scientific answer. And sometimes a scientific answer will not satisfy some people. But if they experience a healing, immediately they'll believe. For some others, they experience healing, they will explain it out in some way. No, no, by chance it happened. <laughs> no, maybe God didn't, something else. They will explain it some way. So even though they experience a supernatural thing, they want logic. So for them, yeah, uh, maybe we have to take a philosophical approach or a scientific approach. Because anything supernatural, they will just try to explain it off. No, 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 it happened like this. It happened because of that. You know? So uh, different people connect to different uh, ways, approaches. One, one way will not satisfy every person. It, the people are different, right? So it's good for us to know, uh, to be open to all of these streams and uh, blend it. And then as we're ministering to people, uh, minister in accordance to what they will respond to. Some people will not believe until you show them from chapter and verse. Show me. There it is. Show me the Bible. <laughs> Only then I'll believe. Okay? I will show you. Okay? So different people, you know, they respond differently. So we will have to adapt and accommodate them. Right? So that's our approach. Um, so let's try to explain a little bit about the word apologia. So we are calling the courses Christian apologetics. So what is this word, you know, apologetics? It comes from a Greek word, apologia, which simply means to give a defense. To give a defense. To defend what you believe. Right? Apologia. So we will look at uh, some examples. Um, uh, Acts 22. Let's go there, please. Acts 22. Um, and I know... We are doing the book of Acts in uh, our Sunday services. But we see Paul, the apostle, uh, doing some of this. So in Acts 22, uh, there's just one example. There are many places. Acts 22, verse 1, uh, it says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. So that word defense is the Greek word apologia. Hear my defense. Here, basically, it's a response to a charge or a question. Hear my defense. Hear my answer to, you know, or, or to the matter on under question. Right? To answer, to defend. You can see another place in Acts twenty-five. Similarly, Paul is talking here. Acts twenty-five and verse sixteen. Um, it says, to them I answered, or I, I responded, I gave a defense. So, uh, uh, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver a man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has an opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. So that to answer for yourself, that's apology, yeah. To answer for your, so you, there is some question, they're charging you or asking you something. Now you answer. That's your apologia. You're, you're, you're giving a response. You're defending your faith, right? And um, so you, you will find several other scriptures. First uh, Corinthians nine verse three again is used there. First Corinthians nine. First Corinthians nine verse three. Paul writes, he says, my defense, my apologia to those who examine me is this. And then he gives an explanation. 
Right? So my defense, my response to the question, people ask, this is my defense, my answer. Right? So uh, it's used, used in several other uh, verses. Let's go to First Peter, please. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. This is like the, uh, the key text uh, from which this ministry of apologetics uh, stems from. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. First Peter 3 verse 15. Peter writes, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense, to give a apologia, you know, to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So what is Paul, uh, Peter telling us? He says, be ready. All the time, be ready to give a defense, to give an answer. If somebody asks you the reason for the hope that you have, why do you believe this? Why do you believe there is a God? Why do you believe the Bible is correct? Why do you believe Jesus is alive? You know, so many things. So be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason. So that is what. We are equipping ourselves to do, right? to be able to give a reason. And I just want to point out, he says, do it with meekness and fear. Let's don't do it like, hey, I know everything. I know better than you know. Do it with meekness. Do it with humility. With meekness and fear. Do it like that. That's very important. Uh, uh, and, and we will look at some, some more scriptures on that. Do it with meekness and fear. Do it humbly uh, so that as you bless people, right? So we explain with reason what we believe. We point to evidence for what we believe. And we respond to ideas, questions. We respond. So we are not afraid of questions. So people ask, why you say, okay, good, good you asked. I will explain. So don't ask questions. No, 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 no. It's good to ask us. You ask questions. We will be able, we'll be happy to explain. So it says, be ready, be ready to give an answer. So we will get ready as we go through this course. Now, I want us to think about this. That the Lord Jesus was also an apologist. Because he took questions. People came to him and asked questions. He never said, don't ask questions. People, different people came. Lord, what must I do? You know, then Jesus said, you know, what have you learned? You keep the law. Or other question like, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? He didn't say, why are you asking me questions? No. He answered. You know, Who is my neighbor? He answered with a story. With, you know. So, while Jesus went about preaching, teaching, healing, he also answered sincere questions. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He, he was a, you know, must have been a Pharisee or somebody very uh, high up in rank in the religious order. So he came by night, didn't want people to know. Yeah, he's, 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 he's asking Jesus question, you know. So teacher, I know you're, you're someone sent from God. And then Jesus tells Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you cannot enter. Then he, How can a man be born again? And what are you saying? Can you explain? And then Jesus tells him about the work of the Spirit. The, the Spirit moves. You know, it's like the wind. You can feel the wind. You don't know where it's coming, where it's going. That's the work of the Spirit. And you have to be born of the Spirit. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So... He took questions, and people came genuinely you know, with questions. He took them, he answered them, explained them, right? So we could say that, although you know, uh, uh, the Bible doesn't give Jesus a title as an apologist, we can say that in one sense, Jesus explained 
he, he gave a reason you know to to things when people came and asked him right? so he explained the mysteries of the kingdom of god uh he demonstrated so we could say that jesus is the greatest apologist or the master apologist now we are in first peter 3 and verse 15 now i just want you to consider this i am not in any way putting down the ministry of apologists but i want to highlight something Peter is telling us here, 1 Peter 3, be ready to give a defense, answer, to anybody who asks for the reason why you believe, the hope, the hope you have. Now, sometimes, or you know, generally when people read this verse, the implication is you have to be very smart in your head to give a reason. You have to be very... Uh, brilliant you have to you know you have to use a lot of logic and a lot of reasoning it seems like you know so when whenever we talk about apologetics especially in the christian church immediately you think you we think oh this person must be a great thinker great philosopher you know must be highly educated why that's why he's an apologist but i want you to just think about this who wrote this verse peter who was peter he was a Fisherman. He wasn't, you know, he was ordinary fisherman. He was not a scholar like Paul. Of course, Paul was a highly educated man. And, but Peter, who wrote 1 Peter 3.15, was an ordinary man. Right? So, somehow in the Christian church, you know, apologetics is always associated with you know, some big philosopher, some big scientist. Hey, hey, relax. This is Peter. He's an ordinary man. Fisherman. So sometimes, so the point I want to get across is we don't have to be some super brilliant in our minds to be an apologist. Just give a reason. Just explain what you believe, what you believe. Right? Peter is telling us, a fisherman is telling us. Just give an answer. So that means this, this whole uh, ministry of apologetics is for all people. It's for all of us. Right? It's not just for some people with PhD degrees. It's for everybody, for fishermen, ordinary people, that we can give uh, a reason. For the hope that we have. Say it in simple words. It's enough. Don't have to say very complicated. Sometimes you listen to some of these apologists, you don't understand what they're saying. Hey, oh, you are, I said, I don't have no one, can't answer what he say. Because sometimes it gets so complicated. Keep it simple. In fact, the simpler we keep it, the better it is. Because then people really understand what we are saying. If we say so, something so complicated, they don't understand. We also don't know what we are saying. Nobody understands. Right? So keep it simple. It is for all of us to just give a reason why you believe, to give an answer, to give a defense, to give an explanation why you have this hope. Okay? And the second aspect that I want to point to is if you go with the, uh, me to police to ask for. And verse 13 and 14, we see something more. Acts 4, 13 and 14. What would have been Peter's apologia? Really? Acts 4, 13 and 14. Acts 4, 13 and 14. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. So it's like this. Here you have the Sanhedrin. That means about 70 people who are mostly highly educated, 
or very powerful, influential people. Many of them trained as priests. And Peter and John are standing in front of them. And they're looking at Peter and John. Hey, we know these people. They are ordinary fishermen from Galilee. Galilee, you can think Galilee is a countryside. You know, it's not like main city. You know. okay. They're fishermen from Galilee. So they saw these. These are untrained. They, it says here, they're uneducated and untrained men. Hey, they're ordinary people. So Peter and John are standing before these highly educated people. And they're recognizing, yeah, they're ordinary men, untrained, uneducated. But something, they could not challenge them. Because it says in verse 14, they saw the man who had been healed. So in this particular situation, what was their difference? It was a supernatural. That was the difference. They shut their mouths. Finished. <laughs> we tell them, no, keep quiet. <laughs> this literally, they kept quiet. They couldn't say anything. What was their difference? This lame man. He's been lame for 40 years. He's healed. Any, any, any question? <laughs> any challenge? Can you doubt it? You've seen him? Every day you saw him lame. Today he's, he's fine. So, this other thought that I want to bring to us is sometimes the supernatural will dispel all questions, all doubts, even if they can't explain. So, obviously, nobody can explain the miracle other than the fact that God did it. But the heart can believe what the mind cannot understand. And that's what we need. That's okay, you don't understand. Yeah, nobody can explain a miracle. But can you believe God? Yeah. So the heart can believe what the mind cannot understand. And so there are times we just have to depend on the supernatural. We can't give a logical answer. We can't give some big explanation. And sometimes we don't need to. Say, God, you do a miracle, whether it's a healing or an answer to prayer or some situation that is changed, something. God, you do a miracle. Let that answer their question. Let that take care of all their questions, all their doubts. You, that is the best way. So while we are, we are going to study this course and we're going to learn some things, don't forget Peter and John. Don't forget this, Acts 4, 13, 14, that sometimes one miracle will silence everything, will dispel all their doubts, will answer all their questions. Just one miracle. Yes. Then, of course, it's up to them to believe or not. We can't force people to believe. But it's an answer. It's a defense. Why you believe? Because my God is at work. Because my God answers prayer. Because God, people are being healed. Or people are being... The problems are being solved. Life is being changed. They are being set free from different things. That is the answer. Okay? Now... Another person that we want to look at, so we talked about Peter a little bit, is we want to talk about Paul. So Paul is very different from Peter. Peter and John, they were ordinary fishermen. Paul comes from a different background. Yeah, he was highly educated. He was trained as a Pharisee. So that means he went through the training that the, the priests had. He knew the scriptures. The old, when he says scriptures, that time is the Old Testament. He knew the scriptures. He was very scholarly. He studied very well. And then he has an encounter with Jesus. And he becomes a preacher of the gospel. And what we see in the ministry of Paul is he combines the two. 
he reasoned and demonstrated he reasoned and demonstrated both so he will reason he will explain he will answer questions and demonstrate so that is the way i, I would like all of us to take on this subject apologia for us he will do it like the way paul did it or the way the lord jesus did it or the way peter did it is we reason and we demonstrate because we understand that sometimes reason itself is not enough people just need to experience that will answer all the questions and and yes while we believe uh, we expect god to do supernatural things yeah if you ask questions we will answer we're not afraid to answer so we will we will combine both we'll take both right so a uh, one beautiful example in paul's ministry in the, you know i have uh, in the notes i've listed uh, many of uh, you know you can see throughout his ministry but i'll just point to one example if you go to acts 13 uh, verses 6 to 12 please acts 13 verses 6 to 12 it says here now when they had gone through the island to paphos so they're going through the island of cyprus uh from the east coast they come to the west coast which is they come to the city of paphos they found a certain sorcerer a false prophet a jew whose name was bar jesus who was with the pro council sergius paulus an intelligent man this man called for barnabas and saul and sought to hear the word of god but elemas the sorcerer for so his name is translated which stood them seeking to turn the pro council away from the faith then saul who is also called paul filled with the holy spirit looked intently at him and said o full of all deceit and all fraud you son of the devil you enemy of all and of all righteousness will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the lord and now indeed the hand of the lord is upon you and you shall be blind not seeing the sun for a time and immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand then the pro the pro council believed when he saw that he had what had been done being astonished at the teaching of the lord Okay, so think about this. This proconsul, just another term for a governor. He was a Roman governor of that uh, island, Cyprus. He was stationed there in the city of Paphos. Now it says here this man was a very intelligent man. So he was like a thinker, ask questions, reason. He's an intelligent man. But he was also a very spiritual man because he had one sorcerer, person who's doing black magic, witchcraft. He's standing next to this pro council, and he's probably controlling him. Pro council is afraid. He's an intelligent man, but hey, this man has got spiritual power. So you can think about this: that this Roman governor, who is an intelligent man, he's being controlled by a sorcerer, witchcraft person, because he's he has spiritual power. So. we must we must understand this that intelligent people thinkers can also be spiritual people so we shouldn't discard them hey he's a very logical thinker person he doesn't care about spiritual things no maybe he's very interested in spiritual things right so don't uh, just assume that this man here he was both intelligent and very spiritual correct so paul and barnabas come and he's now interested in what paul and barnabas have to say so he's interested in hearing about jesus so he's interested in spiritual things he calls them i want to hear the word of god you tell me what you have to say so they're telling him about jesus but this sorcerer is interfering he's he's trying to keep this governor under his control 
he doesn't want them to him to believe what Paul and Barnabas are preaching. So you can then Paul says, now he's doing it by the spirit of the Lord. He's not doing it out of anger. Right? So simply we don't go and say and do these things. But as in this particular case, the Holy Spirit moved on Paul. Paul said, you know, you'll be blind for a season. He's blinded. Then what happens? Then this says the governor believed. When he saw, he was astonished at what was done. And he was also amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So both things affected him. Both things, right? The teaching of the Lord, that means he heard this. So he was very touched by the teaching. So that affected his, uh, obviously it appealed to his mind and affected his heart. But he also saw the supernatural. And he, be he believed. So here's an example where you're combining both. You're combining reason and demonstration. Right? You're, uh, you're combining uh, 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 reason and you're combining the supernatural. So that's the approach we take. And some people, for some people, that's what they will need to be convinced about the Lord Jesus. Is that okay? So I'm just wondering whether I should continue or pause here. But, um, let me just give one more thought and then we will stop. So um, I want to just, so while we are going to do this course on apologetics and learn how to reason and answer questions, I'll introduce this thought here. We'll pick this up tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, I guess next week, which is we must not forget that the real battle is a spiritual battle. It is not a logical battle. It's not a battle of reason. It is a spiritual battle. So, yes, we will reason, we will give answer, we will explain. But the battle, we must understand, it's, it is more than just reason. It is more than providing good answers. It is a spiritual battle. So the scripture we're going to look at, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And we will stop, we'll pause after this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Paul writes, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So what's he saying? There is the God of this world, the devil. He is blinding the minds of He's trying to prevent the light of the gospel from going inside. So that is the battle. So when people are asking us questions, we, we understand. It's a genuine question. They, they, they're really asking. They, they're genuine. They want to know. But we are also recognize there's another force. The God of this world was blinding their minds with deception. So deception is the devil's biggest weapon. Deceive them. That means, what is deception? It's to get them to believe in a lie. So he's putting lies in their mind. Believe that lie. And the goal is, I don't want the gospel, the light of the gospel to go inside. So the real battle is a spiritual battle. So we will give answer. We will explain. We will give a defense. But the battle is not a battle of reason. It's not a battle of logic. It is a spiritual battle. So that is where other things come into play. 
which is prayer, interceding for them, dealing with using our spiritual weapons to destroy these reasonings and arguments in the minds of people. That's a spiritual battle. Okay, that we have to deal with in prayer as we pray for people. Deal with the anoint with the help of the Holy Spirit. But while we are giving the answers, we'll give the answers. We're not saying we won't answer. We will answer. We will explain. We'll give reason. But understand there is a spiritual side to all of this, which we engage in a different way through prayer and using our spiritual weapons. All right? So we'll pause here for today. Uh, I know uh, I stopped 10 minutes early, uh, but this is just a little introduction. Uh, we'll get into this further next week, and then we'll go through topic by topic. We'll start with the existence of God and, and so on. Okay? Uh, before we close, any questions? Uh, <clears throat> Pastor. Yes. Yeah. So I believe there is only one true faith. I believe there is only one true faith. Okay. Yes. So when we're talking about apologetics, is it uh, confined to only a defense of our Christian faith or is, do other uh, faith backgrounds also have their own apologetics of their own defense of their faith? Yeah, so definitely uh, other faiths and even the atheists, they'll all have their own arguments to try and defend their position. Right? So, in one sense, they're also doing their apology, right? They're also trying, or they're, they're also giving a reason, or they're also giving a defense to what they believe and their position, right? So, an atheist, so when we, example, let's suppose, ex imagine we're talking to an atheist. The atheist will also give reason, uh, uh, arguments, why they believe there is no God. Example, say, have you seen God? I said, no, I've never seen God. <laughs> then he'll ask, how do you know there's a God? Have you not seen him? Has he spoken to you? Has he appeared? No. So his, his, that is his argument. You haven't seen him, and you're saying he is there. then our response will be, okay, have you, so you're saying there is no God, because we haven't seen God. My question is, have you searched everywhere? What do you mean? So have you gone to the full universe and searched and saw that he's not there? Then he'll say no. It's the same, same logic. You're saying, I have not seen God. I'm asking you, have you searched everywhere? He also says, I have not searched everywhere. I've not left the planet. <laughs> Some people have gone to uh, you know certain places. Yeah, we have sent spaceships here and there. But simple same, same logic, right? You're asking me, have I seen God? I'm asking you, have you searched everywhere? So I will say no. So he's saying. Because I'm, I haven't seen God, therefore there is no God. But I will also argue, not argue, my question is, have you searched everywhere? So no. Then how can you say there is no God? You haven't even searched everywhere. You know? So uh, there, is, there are logical questions we can ask each side. Right? Uh, and you know, we will we'll also emphasize, the goal is not to argue, not to fight. But it's okay if you ask questions, we will also ask questions. Logical questions, same logic okay? uh, that we can. And uh, thanks, Tyler. But to answer your question, yes, every, every religion or faith or persuasion, they have their own set of questions. Okay? So let's uh, close in prayer. Any, any questions from online students? Any? All fine. Yes, please. Please go ahead. All right, one more question. 
Yes, go ahead. Pastor, when it comes to the supernatural, how do we distinguish between a supernatural work from mm. the forces of darkness and from God? Because there are people who don't believe in the Christian faith, but they believe in the supernatural. Mm. And they say, we don't need uh, we don't need the Christian God because we have supernatural signs and wonders in our faith or in our mm. Uh, mm. cult or whatever yes. they, they believe in. How do we distinguish between the two? Yeah. So we understand, we recognize that even the powers of darkness work miracles. Well, the Bible teaches us that. For example, Jesus, uh, Paul writes 2 Thessalonians 2. He says, um, the power of Satan comes with all lying signs and wonders. So it's there. We recognize that uh, even the power of Satan comes with lying signs and wonders. But how do we distinguish the two from a believer's perspective and also when you're when you're speaking to a non-Christian, like, you know, how would you engage? It? Now, from a believer's perspective, uh, how do how can we tell the difference between what is from God, what is not from God? We recognize even demonic powers can work signs and wonders, which the Bible refers to as lying signs and wonders. It's not true. It's not. It's a counterfeit, right? So the um, uh, uh, everything, anything that comes from the Holy Spirit, it'll always glorify Jesus. And it will always draw us to Jesus. Right? So Jesus said this, John 16, 13 through 15. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, one of the things the Holy Spirit will do, Jesus said, he will glorify me. That means the Holy Spirit always glorifies Jesus. Therefore, Every miracle that is from the Holy Spirit will always glorify Jesus. And it will always draw people to Jesus. One thing. Second thing, in the context of, this is Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, in the context of uh, the same, you know, what is of the Lord, what is not of the Lord, uh, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. Because he said, yeah, there will be many who will come in my name. They will say this and they will do all these things. How are we going to differentiate? You will know them by their fruit. So the fruit tells us two things. One is the fruit of the person ministering and the fruit that is born in the lives of people who are ministered to. So you look at fruit, fruit in both contexts. The person who is ministering. What is the fruit that is born in his life? Right? So while we see the expression of the gifting of God, if it's a true gifting of God, the fruit will also be an expression of God himself. That is love, joy, peace, kindness, the, the characteristics of God. So if there is only these demonstrations, but there is no virtues of God, then the tree is questionable. The person is questionable. The minister is questionable. Because he said, you will know them by their fruit. The second aspect of fruit is in the lives of those who are ministered to. What is a fruit born in their lives? Because if it's truly a ministry of God, and the works of God works are coming from God, then the fruit that is born in the lives of the people who are ministered to will also be godly fruit. I mean, there will be genuine transformation. There will be, uh, Jesus said, you will bear fruit and your fruit will remain, John 15, 16. There's a lasting fruit. It's not like, oh, I felt very nice in the meeting yesterday. Uh, today I'm like the devil. No fruit. You felt nice, but no change. No. That is not. It's not about whether you felt nice. question is, did your life change? Is there a transformation? Are the virtues of God being created in you? That's the fruit. So that's another way, as believers, when we look at things, we can discern, we can distinguish what's of the Lord, what's not of the Lord. Now, for the non-Christian, we can't explain these things because you know they may not relate to this. But for them, we say, yeah, 
if there's somebody says, you know, hey, in my religion, in my cult, or my group, we also experience supernatural things. I'll say, yeah, that, that is true. We're not denying it. There, are, you know, there are signs and wonders that demons, you know, so we understand that. But the difference is this: the power of God is always superior to the power of Satan. So, example: the Lord sent Moses, take the rod. Go to Pharaoh. Where the magicians also did the same thing. They put the rods down, they all became snake. But Moses' rod ate up all those. In other words, it's a way of saying, this is greater than that. First three miracles Moses did, magicians also did. Fourth miracle, cannot. They said, it is the finger of God. That means the power of God is always superior to the power of darkness. So that's where the differentiator happens, where there will be certain things they will not be able to experience through whatever they are doing. And that's where the power of God can be demonstrated to show that the power of Jesus is greater and superior than the power of darkness. That's the difference. Okay? We'll stop. Well, it's wrong. We'll continue. Of course, you're most welcome to keep asking questions as we go to this course. We'll just pray and close. Yeah. Father, we thank you for this time. And we pray that, Lord, our hearts and minds will continue to be enlightened and maybe be equipped, Lord, to serve you well. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. So tomorrow's uh, Independence Day. So we'll continue next week. Thank you.